Khan. I'm JJ Walsh in Hiroshima. And once again, we have the amazing Asby Brown with us. Thank you so much for joining, Asby. It's always great to be here. I love talking with you. Fantastic. It's always a good conversation. Today, you're going to give us a few insights, secret insights, um, as what you're going to talk about in your keynote uh, for the Minka Summit this year, which is April 19, 2021. If you haven't bought your tickets, make sure you come and meet us at the Hanase Village. Right, Asby? You excited? Yeah, I'm sure it's going to be great. Um, it's the third year. Uh, and I've been, you know, able to be, attend and, and and speak the previous two years, and was kind of surprised that they asked me to be the keynote speaker. Um, the first Mika Summit, the keynote speaker was Alex Carr, you know, good colleague, old friend, uh, just very very knowledgeable. And then the next year, last year, was Yoshihiro Takista, who was one of the first people that I knew of who was uh, rebuilding and moving uh, Minka. Uh, I've also known him for. Gee, almost 30 years. And uh, and then this year they asked asked me. And last year we did that great session that you moderated with the three of us. That was so uh, fun. It was and you great. guys know each other so well. Yeah. So I turned the introductions over to you guys. Yeah, and was that was so really fun. inspired, you yeah. know. <laughs> so so that was that was really great. So on the one hand, it's like, well, you know, there must be other people who could do this keynote but i'm happy happy to do it and sort of been thinking a lot about you know what what do i want to share this year and so yeah we can we can talk about that today and um, I, I still haven't decided totally but i think i kind of know the the general direction i want to take it yeah and your your keynote unfortunately the dinner and keynote is already sold out of tickets but oh we're going to give some key insights so even if you couldn't get a ticket you're going to get a taste of it today right asby mm -hmm. Okay, let's do that. Let's try it that way. Um, I wonder if we can stream it. I wonder we should talk to um, everybody and see if it's possible to, to to stream it. Or certainly, I think they're recording a lot of it. So, yeah, we will at least uh, we'll record it. Later, so hopefully, yeah. we can share it a bit yeah. later. Yeah. Uh, Ethan <laughs> has joined us from YouTube. He says, "Been looking forward to this. Awesome, Ethan. Great to have you here." <laughs> Hi, Ethan. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's interesting because the Minga Summit. Um, as Alex pointed out, uh, you know, two years ago at the first Minka Summit, uh, and again, there was like 300 people gathered in this pretty out of the way place in, in Hala, I heard in that there was outside of Kyoto. God, well, yeah, kind of hard to get to. And he said, this is, this is the Woodstock of, of Minka, Isn't you know, amazing? and it really was, it was uh, the birth of something big. And last year was again, really well attended, similar numbers. Uh, and the number of non-Japanese is what's very striking. And this is kind of an important, um, you know, theme and dynamic for, for what's happening with uh, Minka restoration in general. Uh, and this is something that I'm thinking about a lot is, you know, how this is becoming something that a lot of non-Japanese really, really uh, take interest in, uh, that they are people who want to preserve these things and who appreciate them. And increasingly, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of knowledge uh, outside of Japan and among people who are not Japanese about doing this sort of thing. Yeah. And of course, th there's lots of Japanese. There's the Japanese Minka associations as well, uh, carpenters who are doing this stuff for a long time. There's an incredible knowledge base and experience. But this um, huge, you know, explosion of interest among non-Japanese is very, very remarkable. It's exciting. And I think what you're going to talk about today with Huntington Gardens and how they took apart a beautiful old regal home from Shikoku Island, Marugame, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. then moved it over and then reconstructed yeah. it. Um, yeah. This this is kind of sad that we can't keep it in Japan, but it's exciting that it's being preserved and it's being shared with a larger audience around the world. Yeah, right? it's really an interesting story. And maybe we just sort of dive into that. Um, so many people no, uh, the Huntington Library Museum and Garden, which is in Pasadena, California, which is, you know, really part of Los Angeles. Um, not It's a separate, uh, you know, town, but it's really Los Angeles area. Um, it's more than 100 years old. And the 
Henry Edwards Huntington, who is the founder, uh, was an industrialist and uh, made a lot of money. And he built a fantastic collection of books. And he built a building in 1920 to be the library and, and made these, uh, gradually this became public and became available for people to come. Meanwhile, there was wonderful grounds around this, which developed into a beautiful garden and a thematic set of gardens. So there's different biotopes, there's desert gardens, there's, you know, Asian gardens, there's all sorts of other gardens. Uh, and, and then, uh, you know, to house uh, this growing art collection that they built the museums as well. So it's a wonderful place um, it's really huge. Uh, you know, it's one place to spend an entire day. It's a, a wonderful place for families. And a few years ago, um, they uh, were offered a building from Marugame. Uh, it's called the Yokoi House. And it's the Yokoi family, which is a very old samurai family from the Marugame area. Uh, and the this building was built around 1700, so in the Edo period, middle of the Edo period, uh, and it had been in the family uh, since then. And um, the the you know couple, the Okoys, uh, who I was able to meet uh, when I visited uh, last November, uh, they um, had moved to Los Angeles, moved to the U.S. a long time ago, it's a couple of decades ago, and were uh, very much in touch with the curators uh, at the Huntington, like uh, Robert Horry, who you saw a photo, photo of a moment ago. And this discussion started, what are we going to do with this house? I mean, they would go back once a year or so to make sure it was in good shape, uh, but you know, there was no one to take care of it. So the idea came that they would donate it to the Huntington. And this set the wheels in motion. And the result is, in my opinion, the best preserved, reconstructed uh, Japanese home uh, in North America. Now, there are quite a few examples of, for instance, Minka and other buildings that have been brought over uh, by individuals. Uh, there are tea houses and other buildings that are part of Japanese gardens in different parts of the United States. And some of these are really, really exquisite. Um, but this, in my opinion, was really the best. And it's a very unique house. Uh, so um, the thing about it that I thought was interesting and I think I might want to share uh, at the Minka Summit is, um, well, it's a shoya house and a shoya is a kind of um, government position. Uh, shoya were like village headmen. And um, in many cases, these were samurai families. So it tends to be sort of a lower ranking samurai family who uh, is assigned to be uh, the village headman, the sort of government representative in the village. And this is a hereditary position. And the Yokois had been in that position for centuries. Uh, in their case, this sort of apparently seems to have represented a sort of demotion, that they had been more powerful and more influential and wealthier previously, but because of politics and this was a period of wars, etc., before the Edo period, they kind of apparently were on the outs and they were sort of demoted and became, uh, you know, uh, shoya. But the house is beautiful and quite a few shoya houses, which uh, remain in different parts of Japan, really look like minka that we're thinking of farmhouses with a very large doma, you know, the dirt floored area and the workrooms and maybe a tall thatched roof. But this one is much more like a sukiya, like a, a Japanese samurai house, like a bukeyashiki. Uh, more sophisticated in general, they were doing farming. Uh, in, in Marugami, there were lots of outbuildings. And in uh, the Huntington Gardens, they, they rebuilt the gatehouse. And, and there's some other things that they uh, reconstructed. Uh, but, um, you know, it really is a kind of samurai house. Uh, and the key uh, feature of this is the, uh, 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 the zashiki which is the living room, the tatami matted living room, the formal room with the tokonoma uh, and the, um, you know, the, uh, the, the chigai dana, the staggered shelves, and it opens to the private garden. So uh, it is a remarkable thing. And I, as I was going through it with the curators, and again, these are really, really excellent curators. I, hats off again to Robert Horry, uh, to Philip Bloom, uh, also to Michelle Bailey. These are the people who were involved with this. Um, you know, they, they did a wonderful job 
of deciding how to uh, present the house. And it's sort of nicely zoned. Uh, what we see in Japanese houses in general is often there's a public zone, someplace where neighbors can come, et cetera, and others can come. And then there's more of a private zone, the family zone. And because it's a samurai, yeah, you can keep this slide up for a minute. Um, the samurai houses in particular needed a, a formal public zone where they could receive people of a higher rank, like their bosses would show up and they had to receive them with the proper kind of protocol, etc. So there was this sort of linear, the sort of line of rooms in an array. Uh, I call it an enfilade. Uh, you know, it's an actual technical term uh, of rooms lined up here. Uh, and to the left of this drawing is where the garden is as well. Uh, and then behind that uh, is the private zone of the, you know, the living rooms and the bedrooms and the private sort of uh, study, et cetera, the family. And interestingly, in the center is the butsuma, so where the butsudan is. This is the, the family Buddhist altar um, where the, uh, the you know, little uh, lacquered plaques uh, that uh, memorialize the uh, relatives who have passed on are kept and ceremonies and things are done there. In the center of the house is the Butsuma. And that was very, very interesting. And then there is kind of a service zone as well. So this is a very interesting house. And what was most intriguing is that there are also secret rooms. There's like a secret second floor. And and talking with Robert Horry and and, and you know, about this and the the stories that have come down through the family was that during the Edo, Edo period there were occasionally peasant revolts uh, where you know they were un, uh, unhappy about the taxation or unhappy about something and they would come with their you know uh, you know tools and you know, pitchforks basically and uh, and and complain and and be shouting and some and sometimes this would lead to violence so apparently these rooms were for the family to hide in at times of revolts and there was uh, a window at one place where they could see towards uh, the castle in Marugame and they could kind of know maybe even keep in communication with that so this was very very interesting that there were these secret rooms which I had only seen Elsewhere, for instance, in Kanazawa at uh, lower ranking samurai houses, Ashigaru Yashiki, uh, there were secret rooms, but this was for, for taxation reasons, that they, they would hide these to make the house look smaller. Uh, they were only allowed to have a single floor, but they would have a second floor uh, and they would hide it. And, uh, and apparently, basically, you know, when the inspectors would come around, they would know and, you know, they just pretended not to notice. But this was very in intriguing. So to I've me, seen that at other places, like other samurai houses. Uh, they, they were not supposed to, especially during Edo, which you wrote that yep. beautiful book, uh, Just Enough About, mm -hmm. um, but not supposed to be showy that you have a lot of yeah, money. It was, right? yeah, sumptuary laws. There were strict regulations about the, the, your lifestyle and how big your house could be and how big your gate could be. And only samurai could have gates, for instance. So this was very, very interesting. So um, so this, anyway, the centerpiece of what they did, uh, I mean, the, the Japanese garden at the Huntington is over a hundred years old. And there are a couple of other very nice buildings, a beautiful tea house uh, and a very older building as well that was done in the Japanese style. Uh, so there's a much bigger Japanese garden uh, and they intentionally, um, set the Yokoi house, uh, which they, they call the Japanese heritage Shoya house, in a new setting that includes agriculture, uh, farm plots, etc. And they told me, and I was really, really um, thrilled to hear it, that they were inspired by my book Just Enough, that that was a real you know, a, a key for them to understand how the houses relate to the environment, et cetera, and, and how they don't exist in isolation. They're part of uh, a process of maintaining and sustaining uh, the, the surrounding environment. That includes, of course, Satoyama, the surrounding mountains where people would go to forage for food, get their firewood, et cetera, and also how they handle the water. So in that the Huntington, they even include sort of the water system and they, they have, um, you know, farm plots for various various, um, you know, herbs and, and vegetables and things that are being grown uh, and a pond, etc. So this was, to me, really, really wonderful to see. And, and I'm thrilled that that my book played some kind of a role in that. So Absolutely. what happened? And you, when I heard him, Robert Hordy, when he was talking in yeah. that video, I've shared the link below mm. about the deconstruction and the reconstruction by yeah. the builders from Marugame, a bit of the history of the Yokoi yeah. house. 
Um, but he said, we added sustainable rice farming. And I'm like, wouldn't it be great if we have more of that in Japan too? Yes, <laughs> yes. And this is, again, the irony, right? I mean, there are so many preserved houses and restored houses and, you know, quite a few samurai houses you can see in different parts of Japan. Um Interestingly, I'm, I'm in Yokohama, so, you know, close to Tokyo, there's like nothing <laughs> left in Tokyo, uh, basically from samurai houses, almost almost nothing. Uh, but in other parts, Kanazawa, where I spend a lot of time, this has a fairly, fairly well-preserved samurai district, and there's a wonderful um, samurai house in Matsue as well. But um, So we have this, but rarely is there this vision to try to uh, do, at least for educational purposes, to pass on this kind of understanding of the entire environmental sensibility that uh, was, you know, in place during the Edo period. So this was, again was very, very inspired um, thinking on the part of the Huntington uh, and the curators. And it wasn't easy and it took longer than it was supposed to. And the pandemic was going on, uh, uh, but they did a, a wonderful job. And uh, again, the, you know, they, they figured out how do you get people through it, you know, you know, get them to take off their shoes, all these things which are kind of difficult, you know, outside of Japan, they they came up with pretty good solutions for all of that. Um, and interestingly, uh, yeah, this is a photo of uh, my, this is Robert Horry in the center and my colleague Joe Maross on the right from SafeCast who lives in LA now and a friend from New Orleans on the left. So it was great. We had a nice private tour. This is the Zashiki. It was a beautiful sunny day and outside of the uh, the Shoji and and of course the, the outer shutters were replaced by uh, glass shutters uh, probably in the Meiji period. Um, you know, the, the beautiful garden is out there. So um, it was really, really nice. But um, interestingly, you know, the Toda Komuten, uh, who is a, a very prominent, uh, let's say, Komuten, a, a, a contractor, uh, which specializes in uh, wooden construction, including restoration of traditional buildings. And they're very involved in the Minka Summit. They come every year. I think they even have some sponsorship for, for some aspects of it. They were involved in the reconstruction of the Yokoi house in, in, in the Huntington. And so I was surprised when I was there, they were there. So we all had lunch together, uh, you know, very interesting. And they were also at the um, Timber Framers Guild conference, uh, which was I, on the same trip in November. I was both in L.A. for the Huntington to do a talk there and then also to do a talk at the Timber Framers Guild, uh, which was in uh, Keystone, Colorado, outside of Denver. And um, and to me, it's just wonderful that, you know, everyone's linking up. And, and sharing what they know and inviting each other to come talk and learning from each other. And this is something that I think I want to talk about uh, during my, my keynote at the Minka Summit this year. Um, so, yeah, the, the hunting experience was remarkable and, you know, had a very well attended talk in their beautiful, um, you know, uh, lecture hall and a book signing. Yeah, this photograph is great. It's like many houses uh, that you know, have, have existed for centuries, it's sometimes hard to tell what exactly was the original parts and what was added later. And we're looking at the way these beams work. And, you know, I've been in lots of Minka and lots of samurai houses. And it's like, wow, this is a little complex here. You know, maybe this part on the left was added later. And with uh, Robert Horry, we're going through and trying to figure it out. And, you know, there's a lot of intriguing puzzles, you know, in the house. Uh, but it was, yeah, very, very beautifully, beautifully done. Um, yeah. And there's an interesting thing he says in the video is saying, um, all traditional Japanese houses have these beautiful exposed beams. And many yeah. of us who have bought old houses and renovated know that you have to take off the false ceiling and to see that because to see that that's often added a bit like 50 years later or something yeah right? the ceiling was con yeah this is a very but once you can see thing. the exposed beams then you're really happy but actually yeah. that was covered up for a long time after. yeah well you know and to oversimplify um you know in the earliest days in the prehistoric era and 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 even in the you know through the first, you know, uh, thousand thousand years, you know, up to about one thousand AD or so, most Japanese houses probably were something like this. This photo here, this is a, this is actually another Shoya house in Himeji, which is more like a minka. Has these big beams, uh, which were exposed, and this the 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 ceiling, the drop ceiling, came rather later through sort of a Buddhist architecture, through Sakya architecture, tea house style 
from the aristocratic lifestyle. So it was considered dressier and for something for wealthy people, whereas the, the exposed beams was rustic and, you know, rural and a bit rough. So we do see many cases of farmhouses, of minka, uh, that initially had just, you know, exposed these beautiful beams throughout the entire house, having a ceiling added later and maybe tatami matted rooms and the rooms being made dressier. And, and this, this is definitely part of the aspirations and, you know, what looks nicer and what looks actually like you're more prosperous. Uh, so a lot of us love the exposed beams, but for a, a lot of Japanese history, that sort of marked the house as rustic and, you know, kind of a rough hewn and rough shot. Um, but well, it, often- It shows trends, doesn't it? In, yeah, in the housing it, design. It's about right? aspirations, really. Mm -hmm. and, and we talked about the sumptuary laws, the legal restrictions on what people could have and couldn't have. And for instance, um, uh, you know, you had to be a fairly high ranking samurai to be allowed to have lacquered, you know, um, shelving or lacquered stuff in your house. Uh, lower ranking, even middle ranking samurai in most cases couldn't. But of course, wealthier farmers or merchants, you know, little by little, they would get these things. They would have that done and, and hope that no one would notice or that they would be, you know, donating money to the samurai <laughs> retirement fund or whatever the, the parallel was. And, and they would look the other way. Uh, so they were honored in, in the breach. Yeah, this is the Shiomi house in Matsue, which is beautifully preserved. And they have these full size mannequins dressed up to show it. Um, yeah, this is also a very intriguing house and one of the, the better preserved ones uh, in, in Japan. Uh, uh, so this, yeah, it's a very interesting thing. So we like the beams and often, yeah, we need to go back and, and take away that old, that ceiling to, to see them. But, you know, understanding that um, aspirations are very, very powerful and people always want what the, the wealthier people have or the, the people of a higher status have. And, and this has been a trend in Japan forever. And when the Meiji period happened and that entire, you know, the, that, that system, that caste system with the samurai at the top, et cetera, when that fell apart, then suddenly everybody wanted what the samurai used to have. So everyone was building gates. There was no laws against this anymore. And they could have tea houses and they could have, you know, nice uh, zashiki, et cetera. So it's a very interesting, interesting thing. That is interesting. One trend I've seen recently, uh, like you were, they were talking about uh, making new tiles for the roof. Yes. Um, I've seen that a lot, people making the traditional tiles, but you want to keep the artisans in work. So you want to order new ones, but reuse the old ones. So I've seen a lot of gardens using the old tiles as yeah. edging or tiles at the bottom of the house, like reuse yes, to, to function, yeah. right? It's beautiful. It's a wonderful thing about the tiles. This is one of the more reusable and and we talked about circularity before one of the more circular materials in that sense yeah um when they're not useful as roof tiles anymore uh yeah they're often used for garden ornamentation or built into clay walls as decoration uh, there's a lot of ways to use them and of course tiles are interesting um you know, the, the the older tiles before the industrial age, they were all basically handmade. Of course, they would be very large tile uh, kilns, companies making these things on a very large scale, but they were handmade, hand fired, uh, and, and all they were a bit irregular. Um, both in the way they were fired, there would be some kind of, you know, coloration and, you know, parts would be blacker, or parts would be more silver, et cetera. And, and different regions have different kinds of color to their tile. For instance, I think in your area, there's a lot of reddish tile, uh, which is interesting and other parts have that. But um, in the modern age, then this became uh, industrialized and, 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 you know, mass production uh, and very uniform high quality, uniform quality. Uh, and one difference between the older handmade tiles is that the surface could be slightly porous, so um, it would allow moss to grow. And this is considered a charming thing. Of course, it's bad for the tile. Eventually, it'll crack it and water can get in, but it's considered very, very charming. The newer tiles are uniform and they will last a long time. And there's a lot of developments to make them stronger and lighter weight, etc. cetera. Uh, but they are probably never going to get covered with moss. And uh, so... Uh, you know, often I would think that people would like to use some, there's Robert Orietta showing up there. Um, they would like to use some of the older tiles if possible, but, you know, for a, a new roof to work functionally, 
well for decades, you know, you know, as a tile roof, the new tiles have a lot to recommend them. So it's a very interesting, interesting thing. Older tiles are charming and beautiful, but, you know, maybe you want to use the new ones. Uh, an interesting thing here and this photo is showing or this frame is uh, the older roofs. Uh, there would be a wood structure beneath and on top of that, usually like bark, sometimes very, very thin uh, sheets of wood, uh, boards of wood and then clay. A whole thick bed of clay would be spread on the roof and then the tiles would be set into that. And this was fairly heavy, uh, but it was secure and it worked for, for millennia, really. Uh, but more recently, they've, got, they've done away with using the clay uh, and the tiles are able to be attached. There's usually a little hole at the top, the part that will be covered by the other tile where they can attach it with wire to the wooden framework. So it's a lighter framework and it doesn't have this heavy clay. So this is something... These kind of decisions have to be made when you're restoring something. Are you going to totally do it with the original techniques or not? And of course, in a place like California, there are building codes as well. So they had to uh, both uh, manage to retrofit uh, for seismic reinforcement, which is something that also is done in Japan now. And a lot of people, I mean, I'm talking to people uh, you know, often about how are we going to do the seismic retrofit in this house without changing how it looks and there's a lots of approaches to that so they had to do the seismic retrofits they had to have the water sprinklers etc make sure the materials are fireproof as well so this is there's a lot of things you can, you have to accommodate uh, especially for a building that's going to be public uh, like you know the the Yokoi house uh, at the Huntington in Pasadena so it's a very interesting process and all these judgments that have to be made and uh, but yeah I'd say it was just really really beautifully done Mm, I, you can see some of the the necessary additions here. You've got a smoke detector. Mm -hmm. uh, you would have to probably have that. a kitchen wall coming down to so the fire wouldn't spread from the most common area. If if the kitchen was being used, for if instance, yeah. If you're restoring used, yeah. it, out. in this case, it was it's not you know, but but yeah, lots of accommodations and the wiring and you know, it has to have you know adequate lighting you know for it to be public and you know they did a great job of making this very unobtrusive lighting and things. Uh, so, but there's a lot of decisions to be made and and it really requires you know skill and knowledge and sort of insight on the part of the curators to do this well. So again, hats off to them. Uh, and yeah, and this sets this sets the bar very high, uh, which I think is a good thing for others uh, who will come later. And I, I'm hoping that people from Japanese communities, uh, Japanese government people, make their way to Pasadena to go visit this to see how to do this well. Uh, and and as especially as a sort of broader educational program, so this uh, yeah this is really really uh, nice yeah here's the doma. Uh, can you can you explain the doma a little bit because it's sure. an important <clears throat> part of the house right? Yeah, doma really means basically earth uh, room. Ma is space earth earth space earth earth room, uh, and uh, basically um, it's a large. Uh, uh, earthen floored area in this picture it'll be there in the yellowish part there um, farmhouses often almost half of the house is is often an earthen floored area I call it earthen floors it's, it's clay mixed with lime that is then pounded it's called a tataki as well sometimes uh, and becomes very very hard not as hard as concrete but very very hard and durable and this is a work area so uh, people can enter this with their outdoor shoes on and um, often there's storage for implements and a lot of work can be done in this area. Uh, kind of the, the dirtier work, um, you know, things that's going to make a mess, uh, things that require, you know, use of tools, etc. Uh, that can be done in this DOMA area. And often uh, part of the DOMA, in this case, it's at the upper right corner where the kitchen is, there will be the um, uh, the kamado, the, the cook stove for the kitchen. So often part of the kitchen is is uh, earthen floored and part of it will be a wooden floored area as well. So this is a very, very common feature. Now, in, in a samurai house, for instance, there may be a very small doma usually, um, which is really, you know, just in the back at the entrance near the kitchen, sort of the back room, the service room, what you might even call like a mud room. Uh, and here at the Yokoi house, it's interesting because it's not very big. It's not as big as a typical minka 
farmhouse, but it's bigger than typical for a samurai house. And so it's kind of, you know, a, 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 a hybrid of both. And this to me was very, very interesting. So the roof uh, photos you showed of the, the, the beams, etc. this was above the Doma. And so this is sort of the rustic farmhouse uh, side of the house. And then inside, the other rooms all have the very nicely fabricated uh, ceiling, etc. So the rest of it is a sort of dressier house. And yes, some beautiful details like the nail head covers here uh, in the zashiki and the other rooms. So um, Doma is very interesting. And there are people who still know how to make this tataki, uh, you know, and it, it's a bit uh, laborious and time consuming. Uh, and it, it weathers beautifully. Uh, and there are wonderful uh, places you can go if you many times you'll go to a preserved uh, minka, restored minka, uh, or even one that's still being lived in. And if they have the doma, it ends up having this beautiful sort of rippled surface uh, as it's getting worn down over time. It's a beautiful, beautiful surface, uh, which catches the light very, very wonderfully. Uh, in a lot of cases, though, people just you know, use concrete there. Uh, and uh, this is very, very common. And, you know, there are practical reasons why people may may make that decision practical. And, and I've, I've seen that in a lot of uh, remodeled or houses that still exist. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they often do the doma in concrete. It's, yeah. it seems like it's a, kind a faster connect. Connect, well, you, you know, know it's but cheaper, it's cheaper, I it's durable. Own Twitter has done the tataki, right? Yeah, like, yeah, there yeah, are still yeah. people doing no, it. No, there are people who do it. And, and um, yeah, and Kyle's very interesting. You know, he's, he'll do almost anything with clay and, you know, plastering and, and all that stuff. Um, and there, there's others as well. So um, it can, it can be found, it can be done, but you know, it's like roof thatching um, for, for a long time. I mean, thatched roofs uh, basically in the 20th century began to be replaced by corrugated uh, metal um, for, for fire protection. And uh, eventually building codes required it. So you have a lot of cases where houses that used to have a beautiful thatched roof, um, this was covered up. And um, this is a beautiful, again, the Miki house in Himeji. This is kind of a hybrid. This is not that uncommon to have part of the roof thatched and other parts tiled uh, or sometimes other materials. This is kind of nice. So the ridge here, which requires the, the most durable uh, surface here is tiled. And then the above the engawa, above the surrounding, uh, you know, the eaves, uh, the lower part is also tiled. So it's both dressy and kind of, you know, upscale, but also maintains the, the the rural feeling the, the thatch feeling the beauty of that um but thatch you know when uh the houses the farmhouses the famous gasho zakuti farmhouses of shirakawa go became a um, unesco national heritage site i guess that was am i thinking in the 80s um then suddenly they had to train people to uh re-thatch them and maintain the thatch and and that became a site for learning thatch and help spark um, a kind of resurgence around the, the nation, around Japan, uh, of craftspeople who know how to do thatching. And um, this has been very, very interesting. Uh, so you can get uh, thatchers to come. It's expensive, usually, uh, and it needs to be redone, you know, every 50 years or sometimes more frequently than that. Uh, and I think a, a similar thing is happening with the doma, with the tataki, the beaten uh, clay and lime. Uh, there are people around the country who do that, but you may have to call someone in from, you know, the other you know, across the country uh, to come do that. So I think little by little, it, it could be revived more. Uh, we could see something kind of similar to Thatch happening as people realize that it is an option and there's a lot of beauty to it. I mean, you do it for the beauty and also it is a very sustainable uh, method. Uh, you know, it's just clay uh, and you there's can break it up and use it. Apart. There's yeah. an interesting trend. Like you said, people want to bring the thatch back. They want to yeah. bring the tataki back. They want to bring these traditional methods yeah. back. Yeah. But like Douglas Brooks, who's been documenting mm. wooden boats, or Great. Emily Kaneko Reynolds, who's been documenting yeah. plastering. They know there's a lot of this knowledge that was only taught to apprentices. It was mm. kind of secret. They didn't mm. want to share it. But then it's kind of the knowledge has been lost. So people have yeah. to relearn it, right? So this is, I think, you know, the, one of the big themes that I want to talk about um, at the summit is this loss of knowledge 
And the fact that uh, in so many cases, it is people who are not Japanese, not born in Japan, not ethnically or even you know, culturally Japanese, who are preserving it. And that this has grown and expanded out. Uh, and, you know, we maybe talk about the Timber Framers Guild a bit now, um, because this is something really, really wonderful happening there. Uh, so the Timber Framers Guild uh, was founded in like 1985. And um, basically timber framing, building, you know, with large timbers often in in the west and in, in the united states or in, in europe would be oak or big pine timbers or other other woods like that this tradition pretty much died out in the 19th century uh when the balloon frame the two by four uh construction started to you know happen in the u.s uh and then you know also in europe sort of similar things happened in the modern period it sort of died out uh in the u.s it was being revived I think pretty much you can date it to the 1970s, the mid 70s in particular. Uh, and that's when I got interested. I was in, in college and, um, you know, loved these old houses in New England. And uh, there were books and articles starting to come out about how to do this stuff. And the Timber Framers Guild was really uh, the first generation of people who were starting to share that knowledge. And at the time, it was really focused on preserving this Western, let's say first it's in the United States. So it's, you know, the North American styles of building, traditional styles of building with heavy timbers. And again, it's mortises and tenons and joints and, and people, and I include myself, people who wanted to do this then, um, we had to go find old books. I would go to the library and get old carpentry manuals from the 19th century. We would have to go to flea markets and try to find the tools, the chisels, this stuff, because it wasn't being made. It hadn't been used for, you know, 100 years, basically. So we had to actually reverse engineer it uh, and, and revive it. And, and then it became, uh, it just had a, a massive revival all across the country. And the craftspeople who were doing this in America were linking up with the ones in Europe and then linking up, increasing with people like people in Japan. So the Timber Framers Guild, it has thousands of members, uh, some of whom are, you know, large companies that are building lots of buildings every year, some of which are just a single carpenter or maybe there's students, there's others. It has really, I, I'm not sure the number, but it's a few thousand. And their conference, uh, which I was invited to attend, uh, last November had about a thousand attendees. It was in Keystone, Colorado. This is a beautiful, there's a, this a resort, it's a ski resort called Keystone and it's built around this wonderful lake and, you know, it was cold, <laughs> uh, but it was a wonderful gathering and um, I felt really at home. Uh, you know, I was like, wow, this is a, uh, uh, you use the word brotherhood. I don't mean to over gender it, but it was a society of people who love the same thing. And as I mentioned, the Timber Framers Guild um, uh, has, they've been attending the, um, the Minka Summit in Japan the past few years. And, and last year it was uh, Autumn Peterson who's one of the, you know, let's say, you know, important members and a guy named Eric Howard who attended and they invited me to, to come to the, their, their uh, conference, you know, last November. Um, it was really, really interesting. Uh, and, you know, so often if I'm making a presentation about Japanese carpentry, for instance, it's to people who don't know anything about it. It's the first they're hearing. But um, talking to this audience, they already knew a lot. And so many of them were interested in Japanese carpentry. Many of them had come to visit at some point where many of them are using Japanese tools, especially Japanese saws. This was, again, remarkable. Almost all of these people have Japanese tools in their toolkits. Uh, and this is, you know, to me, incredible. Again, I'm thinking back to the 1970s and here we are, you know, 2024 and how much this has changed. Um, so... Um, uh, and then here, I mean, you're showing some wonderful photos. There's, uh, uh, again, um, uh, Autumn Peterson, who has a wonderful uh, company called Heritage Natural Finishes, which provides natural finishes for timber framers, you know, oil-based things. She also ha has a wonderful bookstore. 
a book comedy called Summer Beam Books, which has the best collection of books on wooden construction and architecture. And every book on Japanese uh, wooden architecture that, I mean, many of which I have and many of which I want, you know, and, and, and then they have all my books. So I was able to do a book signing. Uh, just it's about knowledge. They're sharing knowledge and training people. They provide uh, scholarships for students who want to study uh, and learn engineering for timber framing, for instance. They they have educational programs all over, workshops, you know, all over the country. It's really, really great. Uh, and so one thing that struck me, and I had known uh, people like Americans who became uh, trained in the Japanese style as carpenters, trained in Japan. Um, there was one remarkable uh, person who passed away uh, a few years ago named uh, Len Brackett, who trained with a carpenter that I know in Oh, new in Kyoto, who also passed away, and he went back to the U.S. and uh, made a company in California. Uh, and he had an incredible waiting list of, of of clients. These beautiful buildings, and then kind of interpreting them. So it's evolving. It's not exactly like it would be in Japan. It was very authentic in terms of craftsmanship and 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 feeling and design sensibility, but then also evolving slightly uh kind of like how food evolves like how sushi in america is not really like sushi in japan uh and but beautiful exquisite uh and so there were people like that and at the timber framers guild there were a few people talking about japanese carpentry one of whom was a guy named jan uh Giger, who is a, a french canadian and he has a company called mokuchi uh in upstate new york now and that does Japanese style construction. And it's beautiful. It's really, really high quality, very authentically done. He learned in the United States. He apprenticed um, with uh, a guy named Dale Brotherton, uh, you know, who I think knew, knew Len Brackett and he had uh, uh, trained, you know, with someone else uh, in, in Japan, etc. But now there are people like in the United States who are learning Japanese carpentry and building very authentic Japanese style buildings who didn't learn in Japan. Now, this to me is a remarkable, you know, uh, landmark. Uh, and I think we will see more and more of this. Uh, and there are people, um, uh, you know, I know I, I met uh, I, a friend of mine in, in, in France. Her son, his, her French son, uh, you know, did a workshop on Japanese carpentry in Paris, you know, and he's learning the tools and he's learning this stuff. So this is this global expansion of understanding and knowledge. And again, if you're a pure traditionalist, if you're a purist, you might go, uh, you know, it's not exactly the same, but, but kind of, that's important. And, and that it's so evolve. important, isn't it? Yeah. That this is being evolved yes. into something that probably has insulation, mm -hmm. uh, the things that Alex Curry talks about having the traditional aesthetic, but bringing it into modern relevance, right? Somehow. It's going to change. And then it'll come back to Japan. Yes. And, enthusiasm, right? and this is what we're seeing. And um, for instance, I think there'll be a much larger group from the Timber Framers Guild attending the Minka Summit this year. And I, I'm hearing and hopefully I'll spend some more time with them uh, traveling around the country and going to see see more uh, Japanese buildings and, and learning more, meeting uh, craftspeople here. That'll be very, very interesting. Uh, at the same time, um, one of the presentations at the uh, Timber Framers Guild conference was from a, a group of uh, members of, you know, North American members who helped with the reconstruction of Notre Dame Cathedral, which, as you know, a couple of years ago had a devastating fire, uh, basically lost its entire roof and this uh, beautiful uh, spire over the nave. And uh, this has been a very, very um, important project, restoration project, and they were able to get involved uh, in a in part of the restoration of that, and uh, and and then as 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 part of that work, they, for instance, uh, made a uh, a reconstruction of one of the huge roof trusses, which you know th that roof you know com uh, com comprised the main part of the roof structure of, of of Notre Dame, 
which they have exhibited and they do workshops, they can disassemble it and then have workshops. Uh, they're going around like the United States uh, doing workshops where people can come and learn how to assemble this roof truss. It's, it's huge, you know, this huge roof truss from Notre Dame. Uh, so this to me is wonderful. So the European, you know, craftspeople are connecting with the North American craftspeople and they're connecting with the Japanese craftspeople. And it's all a little different. You know, they're all local variations and based on environment and climate and history and, and the material they're using and, and, and just culture. Uh, but they're speaking with each other and participating and helping and sharing. And I think this is how we develop um, uh, generations, younger generations who care about this stuff. Uh, and how this is going to continue. And again, as you mentioned, Joy, yeah, it's kind of too bad that, you know, we aren't able to have more of this kind of important restoration happening in Japan where so many buildings are being lost. So many uh, minka are, are just crumbling and, and nobody is going to use them. And, and the reasons are, are, are always... Um, you know, uh, financial, the tax, the demographics of the village, no one's living there, it, they become economically unviable, etc. Uh, and then there's so many of them, local governments, they just really don't often have the wherewithal to really support uh, maintaining these to the degree that they need to be maintained. So it's and a shame. The, the question <laughs> of how to use them, right? Yeah. Like I, I often do consulting for tourism organizations trying mm -hmm. to create international visitor appeal. Using old houses is wonderful, but you have to find a uh, appealing way to use them. Yes. Is the only way to use them as a museum? I don't think so. Mm. I think if you reuse them as a really nice coffee shop or reuse them as a nice restaurant, you know, like to make something that has a service plus experiencing the house, mm. Yeah. In beauty, that yeah. might be more appealing, right? <clears throat> yeah, and there are examples, and 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 yes, uh, tourism is one of the big anchors for uh, restoring and preserving uh, old old buildings, houses primarily in Japan. And this is something, yeah, again, Alex Carr talks about quite a lot. He's been involved in in a number of projects in Japan specifically tourism oriented to to use this cultural heritage this this built heritage uh because you know we understand we've known for a long time uh that you know visitors over especially overseas visitors want to see something authentic they want to go see something they can't see elsewhere and they want it to be authentic and accessible yeah this is again the shiomi house in matsue which is you know uh it's a museum uh, uh, and, you know, there are a few other old buildings in Matsue, which are being lived in, etc. But mainly, you know, there's a, a handful of, of museums where people can go. Um, so this is, yeah, this is a huge, a huge issue. And we're all confronting it. Uh, and I think uh, welcoming some degree of uh, hybridization and change and modification, I think is is going to be necessary. And, um, and hopefully there will be uh, enough uh, very carefully historically preserved, uh, you know, for historical reasons and to, to really convey the actual techniques and materials that were used and the actual sensibility. But as we are going to reuse them, you know, we can approach this with a great degree of freedom, uh, you know, and, and, and liberty to reinterpret and adjust things and modernize some parts and keep other parts old. And, you know, we should be able to do this. And I say this as someone from New Orleans, where this has been going on for, for generations. Yeah. Can you explain a little bit, using this map that you sent me, about how modern things are being added to these old houses? So on this map, it's interesting to see how the toilets are ah. often added outside the building because... Yeah. They okay. were part of the structure, I guess. Yeah. Right? So this again is the Yokoi house. And this was actually based on a plan that they sent me was kind of just a schematic diagram of the original uh, configuration before it was dismantled and moved. And um, well, in Japanese, you know, traditional homes, the toilet was uh, often a little like a, a room sort of tacked on uh, somewhere, uh, you know, to the house, sort of out of the way. Uh, this is interesting because you can see one to the right that's near the Zashiki reception room. Uh, and this would be the guest toilet. Uh, 
Uh, and it was interesting because when I was in Matsue, actually going through with some local government people, showing it also had the same configuration. And I said, oh, over here is probably a toilet. There's the toilet. And they said, how did you know? I said, yeah, because this was typical, especially in like a samurai house or, or a house of someone with a higher status. They would have a toilet for the guests to use. Uh, and the other one in the back, or often it would be across the, the kitchen yard, uh, would be for the family. So in here, there's one in the back. And then you see a little bath building, an ofuro building. They call the old bath, the kyufuro. That would be sort of added on there as well. And these things were often the first to get updated. So I've been in, you know, again, many uh, old uh, farmhouses in Minka and other houses where you go into the bath and it's, you know, 20th century tile uh, you know, and the, the old wooden bath has been replaced by something's probably tile or something else. And so they get updated because, well, you know, they get a lot of use and they wear out and people want to have a comfortable bath and toilet. So uh, it is interesting. And the same thing happens in kitchens. You know, you find very few. I mean, and, and it makes total sense. Um, you know, people want to modernize the kitchen. So even what we saw a lot of in the 20th century was the commodo, the wood fired clay stove would be replaced by one made of sort of tile. Uh, but it still could be wood fired. And then later, this would maybe be replaced by something gas, gas burning. Uh, and then the modern kitchen sort of came in. Uh, so these things are often the first to be updated and, and, and often need the most work to, you know, restore them to their original conditions. Now, you've done other books on more modern Japanese building yeah. design. Yeah. Have Japanese you modern. noticed that these themes of kind of keeping the toilet or keeping the kitchen to one area of the house has kind of continued with modern, like you would never see a toilet bath in the middle of the house where you said used to be the altar, for example. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. you're absolutely right. And we see, a, it's really interesting. And I've talked about, we maybe even talked about this once at an earlier podcast, but you know, Japanese homes have kind of this mental zoning based on cleanliness. And we talked about the doma, you know, being the, the dirt floor and you can wear your outdoor shoes. Well, most people's homes, the, the entranceway, um, you know, this has a, you know, uh, it's considered the same thing. So you can wear your, your, your dirt shoes. The toilet is the dirtiest part. You have to wear special slippers there and you can't walk out of the toilet with the toilet slippers on. That's a huge faux pas. Uh, and the bath is like the cleanest part. Uh, you go there, it's where you get ritually cleansed. So the, the, the thing is, yeah, the toilet is almost always in Japanese homes, a separate uh, a water closet, like a WC. It's a room, a little thing that just has a toilet and a wash basin, maybe. Uh, and it's not going to be in the same room with the bathtub. That is like horrifying to most Japanese people. Uh, although in small apartments that have a unit bath, that is often found. You know, you do see, I had a little apartment that had the toilet in the same room as the bath before. Um, that's really the lowest, you know, lowest, uh, you know, cost option. Uh, and uh, the bath also would be separate. I, I was surprised that the bath is generally on the ground floor. Like when we were building our house, I designed it so that the bath would be on the second floor near the bedrooms, which makes a lot of sense, you know, in terms of, you know, lifestyle and flow. And the carpenter was, are you sure? Are you sure? You know, he couldn't believe I would do that. But pretty much every home I've stayed in in Japan, even if it's a two story house, uh, the bath is almost always on the ground floor near the kitchen. Generally, it's, it makes sense because that's called the Mizumawari. The water, the piping and the plumbing can all be sort of, you know, put in the same place. Uh, and here in this in this uh, drawing you're showing, yes. So near the kitchen, you know, the old bath was near the kitchen. And that makes sense for running the plumbing in earlier ages. But of course, now we have a lot more flexibility. Uh, but usually the bath would be on the ground floor and you'd have to like come downstairs and, you know, do your stuff and take your bath and then go back upstairs to the bedrooms, for instance. So this is a very interesting sort of mental, uh, what, what's considered mentally uh, appropriate. And uh, it's changing. Uh, technology has allowed that to change. So I do see a lot more modern houses uh, with the bath put, you know, near the bedrooms because it makes more sense. And uh, uh, still, uh, it is kind of um, surprising to a lot of Japanese people when, when you do that. It's so interesting. Yeah. And the design of a merchant house or a samurai house, mm. the front of the house where the guests would be greeted versus the private part yeah. of the house, um, the decoration, of course, mm -hmm. it's a bit more elaborate in the place that they get visitors, right? Yeah. And then a little bit more plain at the back. Have you noticed that? Well, you know, it's interesting. 
Um, it kind of goes two ways. Um, and again, first of all, merchant houses, usually there was a shop on the ground floor uh, and you may have to go in or maybe there was like alongside that was sort of the private family zone, which could be looking fairly similar in terms of the, the zashiki and how it's designed. It could look very similar to a samurai house. The samurai houses, again, it had to be appropriate for your station, for your rank. So, um, and usually that meant the zashiki was not going to be overly fancy. It was going to be dignified. And that often meant fairly subdued. And in the case of the yokoi house, if you see a photo, maybe it has this interesting gray plaster walls, uh, very subtle, almost an ashen gray, which is fairly unusual. But it's very subtle and low key. Um, and often what we see is in the private rooms, especially the master's study, there's often a room uh, that's like a study. And that can be a little more uh, unique and idiosyncratic, uh, you know, showing her, his personal private taste. Uh, so this is, I, I saw this in, in the house in Matsue, and I've seen this in houses in Kanazawa, and I've seen, I think the Yokoi house is very similar. Yes, do you see this gray plaster? This is the original uh, before it was uh, reconstructed, but they maintained that. And it has a beautiful play of light. When you look at it, you, you initially think, oh, this is two or three different colors of plaster different shades of gray, but it's actually just how the light and shadow works. It was really, really exquisite. Uh, so this is very, again, very subdued and uh, uh, it has to be dignified. So to be too showy uh, is not appropriate. Yeah, this is again, the show me house in, in Matsue. This is the, the, the main reception room. And again, it's pretty subtle, but when you go into the private room, then it's a bit, I think this one has the, the nail heads in the private room are like uh, the form of a swallow or something. So um, a little more playful and fanciful. Yeah, here in this case, it's, it's butterflies there. So um, it's, yeah, very interesting what's considered appropriate, what's going to raise the eyebrow uh, of, you know, your, your boss when he shows up, you know, thinking you're, you're trying to be fancier than, than you should. You know, Wait, and again, in the Meiji house, period, is this pardon? the bathroom? No, the in Shiomi house, this is this is the kitchen oh, of, okay. of the Shiomi house. This is part of the kitchen, which um, has you know this sort of bamboo floor again because you're splashing water, and that would allow the water to to go through. On the right, lower right is uh, the kamado there, uh, and um, over, you see like water buckets. This case, there's a well right outside the kitchen door. This is often the case. Um, so they could bring water in very, very easily. So, um, and again, this sort of thing, maybe it was a bamboo floor at one point, maybe it comes a wooden floor at another point, maybe it comes bamboo again. Uh, but it, the interesting thing is that um, all of these, you know, very specific requirements and regulations, they all fell apart in the Meiji period. And basically you could have whatever you could afford. So, you know, people who were from commoner families, wealthy merchants, could then um, have elaborate lacquer, you know, uh, in their, their, their rooms and to have tea houses and have all sorts of things that they had been prohibited before the major period. And this is, again, interesting about aspirations. And now, of course, people have whatever they want. Uh, and they look at the samurai houses and often they think, this is kind of grim, you know? They were samurai, weren't they? You know, the elite, why are they living in such a grim, you know, uh, house? Uh, because, you know, they were, it's about discipline and, um, you know, maintaining uh, sort of anti-consumerist uh, uh, ethical values. I love these trees. I see yeah. these trees a lot in Hiroshima. We actually yeah. have some A-bomb survivor trees, which are mm -hmm. kind of like this palm. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't seen it in front of a samurai house. This is interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. Original, it's right? very, very, yeah. Apparently it's very, very old. And I'm not sure, you know, but uh, imported at some point. I don't think it was indigenous to Shikoku, but I'm not sure. Uh, imported at some point. And again, gardens were, of course, in Japan were great. And yes, this one, the Ritsurin is in Takamatsu, which is very close to, to um you know, uh, Marugame. And of course, this, I'm sure, played a, had a huge impact on what people thought ideal gardens were in that region. And, and um, even the little garden uh, at, uh, you know, the, the Yokoi house, it has a little bridge, it has a little pond, it has a lot of the same sort of features, but of course, in miniature. 
Uh, but I think the Ritzerin Garden probably had a huge impact on what the gardeners and the, 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 the owners wanted to do with theirs. So Ritzerin, of course, is gigantic. I encourage everybody to go see that. I'm sure you, you've taken people there probably many times. Yeah. I've, I've only been a couple of times. I'd love to go back. It's beautiful. Yeah, no, it's great. I, I was and, there last and year. Ashby, can you just comment? Because a lot of traditional Japanese gardens, the most famous, the most beautiful ones, you don't see a lot of color, like man-made painted bridges. Everything is pretty subtle, pretty natural. Yeah. And then they let the seasonal color really play yes. a role. Is that right? Yeah. That's exact, and and again, Ritzerin is a wonderful example. Um, like this image looks like autumn, right? Uh, you can based on the sort of colors of the trees, but it is planted so that over uh, through the seasons there is this constant change in color. So it has quite a few sakura, cherry trees, uh, but sort of put in specific areas where, depending on where you're looking from they just makes makes a beautiful design and it's it looks kind of natural but of course it's been arranged by the by the gardeners uh and the same thing for the autumn foliage where the trees that will have the the, the most beautiful red and orange colors they're carefully placed uh to be viewed from certain angles and areas uh and then there is like the ritzerin uses this there's something called shake and i think the yokois did as well something beyond the garden so the mountains and the hills beyond the garden uh far away is integrated into the design of the garden so this is kind of a wonderful thing uh and of course this is the reconstruction in pasadena where it doesn't really work i think as it did uh originally in marugame but yeah there is there are outside features maybe trees maybe landscape maybe mountains and hills uh, in the distance which are brought into the into the garden so yeah it's kind of a remarkable thing there are red bridges here and there uh and they're really considered showy and um, people much prefer, you know, the natural wood that's aged and, and speaks of the passage of time. Uh, and there are lots of temples, as you know, that were originally brightly painted and eventually the, the paint wears off, you know, and they decide not to repaint them because the natural wood, this aged natural wood, seems to be just more aesthetically pleasing and um and again speaks about time so uh yeah it's a wonderful wonderful aspect of japanese culture i think well maybe your next book will be about japanese gardens perhaps maybe <laughs> maybe there's a lot to say there's, there's a lot to say, say. and it i, I, I question so whether i have with the, house design right <laughs> yeah yeah i question whether i have the expertise because there are so many people who are really really knowledgeable and so many great books but there's a lot to yeah there's a lot to say about about it, um, and I'm very interested in the relationship between gardens and and agriculture, because you know they're kind of related in so many ways. Um, you know, planting people are planting, and and this sort of husbandry of of, of taking care of uh, plants and moving things and bringing in new species and and uh, you know making this this sort of human influenced natural environment. I think it's a very very wonderful aspect of civilization in general. Absolutely. Well, on that note, we will have to end. Thank you so sure. much, Asby. What a wonderful conversation. No, thanks again for having me. And I'm looking forward to seeing you at the Minka Summit, if not before, and encourage uh, people to attend. And I'm sorry that the keynote and dinner are sold out. Um, but, you know, I hope people, that doesn't dis discourage people from coming. Yeah, I hope not, because there's a lot of uh, chances to talk with As Asby outside, and yeah, you're also I'll be hanging, be on the uh, panel. I'll be hanging around. Right? I'll probably do book yeah. signing and uh, hope to take some of the field trips as well. Um, yes. So that'll be great. And you're on the panel once again, uh, and Stuart will be doing the moderating this time. Yeah, so yeah. Lots of great insights there as well. Yeah. But thank you so much for joining today, giving no, us a little preview. My pleasure. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks, yeah. everyone, for joining. Great. Okay. And uh, Andrea and Bradley, final comments. So glad you two are having this discussion. Ongoingly invaluable. <laughs> fantastic. Thanks, Bradley. Andrea, wonderful talk. Fascinating. Thank and you th guys thank so you, much Andrea. And thanks for all of your hard work, Andrea. <laughs> yes, for the Minka Summit. It's coming up. Mm. They're very busy. Thanks, yeah. everyone. Have a great day. Thank you, Asby. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.